Welcome back to Following Noah on a Stormlight Podcast. This week is episode 18, and we are going through chapters 60 through 63 of The Way of Kings. Uh, we've got a some nice action in this in these chapters and some interesting scenes between Navani and Dalinar, which I know you're excited to talk about, Paul. <laughs> um, do you have any do you have two words for these these ep- these chapters? So I I do I so my two words for this chapter, I think these are extremely fitting and they're not very. They're for almost the same thing. So I have resourceful, and I have surreal. Okay, resourceful and surreal. Uh, Elliot, what are your two words? My two words for these chapters are desecration and inspiration. Desecration and inspiration. All right, let's let's you got discuss it. these words. Desecration is an interesting word, Elliot. Do you want to tell me tell me a little bit about that word for these chapters? So I picked that word because we get a really epic scene with Kaladin. Really exciting, action-packed, really cool to see Kaladin discovering his new abilities. But I left that chapter with a little bit of fear. I'm a little scared that what he's done the desecration of the Parshendi bodies, in at least in their minds, I think that might come back to haunt him. And I'll talk about why when we get to that section. Okay. Uh, what, your, what was your other word? Inspiration? Inspiration, yes. So we got two examples of, of inspiration. One in Noadon, who we get to meet, like straight up meet and talk with which I thought was awesome. I really enjoyed that discussion between Noadon and Dalinar. So Dalinar gets inspired by getting to meet Noadon. And then we see some more examples of the Bridgemen really getting inspired by Kaladin. We, we've seen that for a while now. That's been kind of a running theme, but starting to bear some fruit. The fact that they are so uplifted now by Kaladin's inspiration. Some of them are even willing to fight more than Kaladin is at the moment. Some of them are just exactly. itching to do something. Exactly. All right, uh, Paul, what are your two words, and what do they mean? So so my two words, they're for similar reasons. So first of all is resourceful, and that's part of what we'll talk about with, with Kaladin, in, uh, almost with what Elliot was saying, with desecration, with what he does with the Parshendi bodies. Uh, as well as his use of his his new cool little surge binding power, mm, I guess yeah. that could be considered considered pretty resourceful. There, he he's really starting to get the hang of it. We see, and, and it's a super cool moment. Uh, and with surreal, it's partly for some of the conversations with Dalinar and Cal or Dalinar and Noadon. And partly for the epic scene that we'll talk about with with Kaladin, um, in in the Bridgeman in the Bridge Crews there, his new tactic, um, which were pretty awesome. I also this is I guess a little bonus word. So it my the, my first thought was risky, okay. and I removed that word because. With, with Kaladin's situation, the things he is doing are very risky, but I actually removed that because uh, whenever we talk about it, I think he is very confident in this, and I don't think he's actually as worried as maybe he should be. I guess it's a major risk, but I, I think I think there's a great deal of confidence there, and it was a super awesome scene, so I actually removed that word as one of my two. Gotcha. All right, we do not have a spell check. We didn't really have any new uh, new words this week. Um, so before we get to this, these uh, awesome, fun Kaladin chapters, we do have to talk about Dalinar. Um, we get a flashback with Noadon, and then a nice scene between Dalinar and Navani, and we'll we'll talk about that in a little bit. 
Um, but first, Dalinar, chapter 60 opens with Dalinar. I believe Adolin is there, um, Navani, yep. and um, Navani on her hand has a pain reel, is what she describes it as. And she's, she's ex- like, she's kind of showing it off, hoping that somebody will ask about it. And it's this new technology. Um, did any of you have any thoughts on that? The her new her new Fabriel. I'm fascinated by the Fabrials as as an engineer myself. I want to know how how they work. So I've I've always keyed in whenever we get some more information about Fabrials. And this was a sections. I noted that she described it as a diminishing Fabriel, as if that's uh, like a type or a subset of of Fabrials. And she kind of contrasted it. To a paired fabrial, which the example she gave was a span read, which we've seen the span read before. Mm. And that makes perfect sense that it's it's a gemstone or, or fabrial powered by stormlight that's paired with another one to perform the the cool message sending that the span read does. Now she's got the pain reel, which is a diminishing fabrial. Somehow it's diminishing the pain that she's feeling. She what? She uses it on Adolin, I think. He's got like a sore hand or something and he's yeah. like amazed that it works. Yep. But he can still feel in his hand, but his pain is less. Right. Yeah, I was intrigued. I thought that was cool. That was cool. So so Trevor mentioned that we kind of have to get through these. Well, okay. Not quite like that. We have to get through these Dalinar chapters to get <laughs> to the phone Kaladin chapters. I, I have to say this chapter, this first one that we're going to talk about, sixty chapter 60, is actually one of my very favorites. And I actually really, really enjoyed it. I have to say, like, I think this episode may be my favorite yet. Okay. I think it was just packed with awesome moments, despite even the Dalinar and Navani <laughs> moment, which I'm not a huge fan of. Uh, but but I think these are actually super exciting, and I, I really love these flashbacks with Dalinar. I think it's my favorite part of his storyline as we look into this. Um I also think the Fabrioles are really cool. Maybe I don't look into them as much as uh, as our resident engineer here does, but I do. I do remember that. Yeah, exactly. Uh, but I, I did think that was super awesome, and uh, it seems like Navani. The, the coolest thing about her, from what I can tell, she always seems to know this like cool, fancy new these new gadgets. Almost like in in previous chapters, there was like a banquet where she was talking about that they're trying to replicate shard plate, mm-hmm. I believe. And she was talking about all the, the new updates with technology and stuff. And so we always see some cool stuff with her. And so I actually really enjoyed that. Um, I, I think Navani is a, is an engineer as well, at, well at least at heart. They yeah. have a word for it in this universe, don't they? What? I don't know off the top of my head, but I think they do. Um, it. She was an, close to the. She's an art of Fabrian, is what. Yeah, is, that's is the word title. I'm thinking of. Yep. Which actually, hold on. Um, I have some artwork for you guys. I forgot to post this, but I will post it now. This photo is titled "Art of Fabrian" by Ari Ibarra. And I will post it in our chat right now. You guys can have a look at it. This is of Navani. Um, but yeah, she's an art of Fabrian. Um, in this picture that once it finally uploads, uh, you'll see there's a, she has a Fabrial on her wrist. Um, and yes, she's definitely an engineer and enjoys all things uh, engineering. Any thoughts on this this piece? I love looking at the the artwork that you share with us. I love envisioning these characters and these events and these places in my mind and then comparing that to the way someone else in envisioned it and this also, I got to say her dress is like exactly how I how I envisioned it. That's that's yeah. like spot on for sure. Yeah, this was um this is actually a card. Um, th- this artwork is a card in this board game I have behind me. 
Um, the reason why I haven't really shown this off to you guys is it is packed with very many spoilers. So, <laughs> like even like even spoilers from late Oathbringer, like th th there are a lot of of spoilers in this uh, in this board game. But the What's artwork. What's the name of that? Game? The name of the game is Call to Adventure: uh, The Stormlight Archive. Okay. Um, and the artwork in this board game is phenomenal. Like it is so so good. They they contracted a lot of independent artists to do like the cards and the board and stuff like that. It looks really great. I I really like it. That's cool. Yeah, I I am definitely a fan of this piece. Uh, from what I know about Navani, from what we know about Navani so far, uh, as far as I understand, she's she's kind of this almost like social, political type person, you know, and, and almost seems nosy, and it seems like Dalinar kind of almost dreads her to that to that extent. Mm -hmm. uh, but he it does mention that specifically, like with this like engineering aspect in her that's like what she's kind of passionate that's what she's passionate about and, and so she really is fascinated by these fabrioles and stuff which is cool and, and that is a really cool uh piece of art there i don't know uh, let's see if i can look close is that on the bottom right is that supposed to be like a, a gem do you know what that's supposed to be uh, great question. Like I've, a fabrio like, there, maybe? My guess was either, like, a fabrio, or I don't know if that's supposed to just be, like, one of the gemstones that's, like, their currency, but I feel like that wouldn't quite be like that. I don't... I'm not um, sure. Um, are you talking about, like, the... on the workbench in front of her? With yeah, the... on the very bottom right, there's, like, a b white ball surrounded by some red yeah, light. I'm not sure. Like... Okay. Interesting, I guess. Yeah, cool stuff. Yeah. All right, let's let's talk about the vision that uh that Dalinar has in chapter 60. So, he kind of gets dropped in this palace room and he's next to a guy who he quickly figures out is probably Noadon. He we we, we don't know that for sure, but if we're taking Dalinar's word for it and his instincts for it, this is Noadon. And he's kind of poking and prodding him to see if it's actually Noadon. And he starts quoting the Way of Kings to Noadon um, to see if it is him. And Noadon kind of looks at him weird, like, "What you're you're telling my parables back to me? What are you What are you doing?" And uh, Dalinar's like, "Oh, nothing. Don't don't worry about it." But uh, he also doesn't respond to the name Noadon. So we don't know for sure if it's him. And they've said before that that probably wasn't his common name. And the the Voran Church probably gave that to him later, like a title, um, because it's a close palindrome. So it's supposed to be like a holy, holy title name. So he probably wouldn't respond to that name. Any thoughts on this uh, this vision? Just real quick off the bat, I got to give Dalinar some props. He, he he plays it off a lot cooler in this vision than he has in the previous ones. Like in the previous ones, people are, he's constantly doing Dalinar things and yeah. people are like giving him a funny look like, wait, who are you? And in this one, he actually tries to play the role of whoever the person he's in. And he does actually a really good job with that. It doesn't seem like no one notices at all that he's not interacting with who he thinks he is. So props to Dalinar for being a little more sneaky there i think it's i think it's a cool dynamic that dalinar has put note on on such a pedestal of um getting so so much good advice from know and in this vision he is know advisor and so when know asks him some advice dalinar's like wait why are you why are you asking me don't you know literally everything like aren't you like super super smart and Noadon is this young, like young new king who just went through a desolation, and he's like, uh, "No, I need advice. Please give me advice." Uh, and Dalinar's like, uh, "I don't know anything." 
And, and that was part of why I picked inspiration as my my word because Noadon is inspiring Dalinar, but then almost there's this like inverted role here that you're talking about where Dalinar's inspiring Noadon in a way, mm -hmm. which that got me thinking a little bit about whether Dalinar's visions are truly just visions or if it is actually time travel. Mm. Like, did is Dalinar actually traveling back in time during the moment that would create, you know, spark Noadon to write this book? For instance, like if this didn't happen, would Noadon have not gone on to write Way of Kings? Interesting. Or or is this or is just Dalinar's visions like, you know, a movie being played back for him? And and yes, the people interact with him, but he's not actually being that if if that makes sense. Right. It definitely does. And that was I'm really glad you brought that up, Elliot. That was probably my first thought whenever whenever he mentions the book there, he's like, you should write a book. Right. Because he, he, he loves the way of Kings. He knows that no one on wrote it. And so Dalinar is just like, you need to write a book. Like, this is the best thing ever. Um, and he's like, why would I write a book? Like, that's a dumb idea. And I, I actually thought that was hilarious. Uh, I This was one of my favorite moments ever. And, and I like what, what Elliot mentioned. Dalinar is way more, like, casual about it. And and he really wanted to find more information. And what I really liked about it was that Dalinar gets to see that this almost idol in his mind, this know-it-on who is where he, he's gotten all of his wisdom from, right? Uh, for the most part. That know-it-on had these struggles similar to him and had these same doubts and questions and kind of humanized him, I guess, a little bit. For sure. And I really liked that. I thought that was an awesome, awesome thing to do. Um, and I was really stoked. Like with that whole interaction, I felt like that was really just, just great. Like that, that was just awesome writing and uh, what Dalinar needed, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> so I, um, assuming that this vision, we can take it at face value and this is real and this is, um, oh boy. And this is actually know it on Elliot. Would you like to circle back to your original hypothesis on who know it on is <laughs> of a knowledge friend from what, whatever episode that was where we had those predictions? I I had almost forgotten about that. I had almost forgotten about that. Yeah. Hmm. That prediction is probably not looking so hot about now, huh? I mean, it's definitely not disproved yet. It's possible that this isn't know it on. It's some random guy. Yeah, it's possible I, that he's still a knowledge friend too. We don't. We haven't. Didn't. They haven't proven that not to I, be so. I have a feeling that that prediction could hang on by a fraction percent for a very long time because <laughs> I'd be willing to bet. I'd be willing to bet that we don't get enough <laughs> knowledge about what spren are and what they're capable of doing. In the rest of the series, I'm, I'm taking a wild guess there, but I bet that not enough about Spren is defined for us to definitively say a Spren cannot impersonate a person and be, you know, we, know it on here in this moment. We can't ever disprove it, is what you're saying. So you're right, gonna, uh, exactly. Right. Okay. It may be 99.986 percent disproven, but there's a small chance. But there's no confirmation that he is not a knowledge Spren. Right. Therefore, he could be a knowledge Spren. <laughs> right. Right. The, the reason why I bring it up is because when you said that, I I just laughed so so much. I was like, that is so ridiculous, but he doesn't like he doesn't know. So it's, uh, it was very funny to me at the time. I got to say, I felt very similar about similar to you, Paul, in this section and impactful for me. But I chuckle at that a little bit because if the name of our podcast was not following Noadon, I don't think this section would have been nearly as impactful as as it was. The fact that we've trying to been we we're, we've been trying to discover what what this podcast is even named after. What are we what do we mean? And that's 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 been a huge part of my journey through this book so far is looking for Noadon. And it's funny because that that parallels Dalinar's journey rather well, and that that's what he's doing. And this is a moment of. <gasps> We get to meet Know It On, like it's a big moment for mm. me, just like it's a big moment for Dalinar. Right. But for a lot of other re readers, maybe it's not. Right. See, 
uh, I'm sure you two will remember, but when when we were discussing the the title of this podcast, this this title kind of came to me all at once, and I was like super excited about it for like ten different reasons because it worked so well in my mind, and that that's one of them is because we're we're very much like Dalinar trying to figure out what the way of Kings is and we're reading the way of Kings. We're listening to it. We're diving deep into yep. it. There's so many good parallels here. And in last week's episode, Dalinar was quoting the way of Kings and we learned that Noadon went on a literal journey. He traveled from a Bama bar to your and everybody thought he was an idiot um, for doing so. So there's so many, there's so many good parallels with our, the name of the podcast, which I was so excited when I, thought about it speaking of parallels in this noadon section there's there's actually a bit of a parallel between noadon and again assuming this is noadon i suppose but noadon and and dalinar noadon is considering stepping down from his role he's he's seen this desolation occur where nine out of ten of his dead like that's insane right there He's lost 90% of his people. They've died in this invasion from the, the Voidbringers, or we're assuming it's the Voidbringers. Thinking about, you know, I, I failed my people. I need to step down. What, am I even doing any good? That's all the same mental stuff that Dalinar is going through right now. And and Dalinar tells him, you know, no, you can't step down, man. You got to write this book. You got to go off and, and inspire, you know, generations of of people. And it that mirrors Dalinar's struggle pretty, I think. The Knights Radiant base their their the or, their orders and their ideals off of some of what Noadon writes. So Dalinar thinks it's very important that Noadon does go yep. and write a book. Now there's something else though that's mentioned in this vision that caught my eye. And that was the mention of I don't know honestly how to say it, so you guys will help me have to help me with this. The the Nahel bond. It's pronounced with Tell a soft A, right. so it's like a Nahel bond is how they say it. Nahel in the, bond is how they say it in the audiobook, and I okay. see this in the in the outline. I don't really remember the context. Can you can you tell me the context of how it presents it in the book? Certainly. So let me let me just read it for you because the the context of this is is rather important for me trying to figure out what this is. So this is Noah on talking. Our own natures destroy us. Alakavish was a surge binder. He should have known better. And yet, the Nahel bond gave him no more wisdom than an ordinary man. Alas, not all spren are as discerning as an honor spren. And there's a lot of references or several references in there that don't make sense to me. But it seems like the Nahel bond is related to surge binding and spren. And we've learned recently that Kaladin discovering his surge binder abilities is realizing that his abilities are somehow tied to fill his sprint. Mm -hmm. Although we're kind of wondering if she's not a sprint at this point. So I'm not quite sure, but it seems like perhaps the Nahel bond is a reference to that relationship between surge binder and sprint, maybe kind of implying that every surge binder has a sprint, which kind of ties back to the question we were asking last episode of like, do I, have spren like for instance zeth does zeth have a, a little spren does he have a, a nahel bond with his bren Th- those are the questions coming to my mind as i read this paul i mentioned zeth are you, you're not going to weigh in there well i was thinking about this and honestly i'm i'm kind of stumped on this nahel bond like I, I feel like we're starting to see a correlation between surge binding and spren. But you mentioned so in that quote, did it say that because of the Nahil bond, he was like of the same intelligence of someone or, or like the same level of someone who wasn't a surge binder? Well, he, of... seems, he seems to imply that like the Nahil bond should have helped him know better. And we don't even know like did he what kind of mistake he made or did he do something foolish and he should have known better because he's a surge binder. That seems to be the implication here. Okay. I see. And we talked to, well, it seems implied, but also seems like too simple of an explanation in the previous episode. I think we talked about 
what is Syl and, and and how she's making this happen. And it, it mentioned a lot about bonding. She says, like, I bond things. Mm-hmm. And so there's kind of this notion of, like, a bond spread. Ooh. And I don't know if, like... If it is, she literally is a Bond spren, and that's what they do. Yeah, and it's that maybe the actual action between a Bond spren and the Surge Binder that they're with is the Nahel Bond. I had not put that together that she had talked about the fact that she's a a Bind spren or, or something that yeah. bonds things together, and then now we get this mention of the Nahel Bond. Ooh. Okay, I like that's that. the om- absolute only thing I can think of related to. Other than that, I, I'm pretty clueless. Um, but that is that is interesting. I I'm not sure. I'm really looking for. I feel like we would get a lot of answers on that if we learned more about Zeth. So I'm I'm hoping that happens. Because <laughs> if we, we find more out Zeth, Zeth chapters. has his little bond spread, you know, that runs around with them, then that'd be like that'd be a really really big tip towards uh, this information. Brandon um, Sanderson, we need more Zeth chapters. That's a takeaway. <laughs> yes, can't wait. You'll have you'll have at least one more before the end of the book. Don't worry. Nice. I just need one more, and I'll know <laughs> everything. And it's so not even an interlude either. It's a full chapter. We don't have any more interludes to go. Oh. Whoa. That's awesome. I look forward to that. Uh, so, so I think we've covered the vision pretty well. Any any thoughts on the vision? Because when he wakes up, there's a interesting development that happens. So, so Dalinar wakes up and he's kind of frustrated that the voice that always talks to him doesn't talk to him. Um, cause that's where he's learned most of the, the things that he can. And he kind of, he wakes up from the vision. And he's like, well, that was pointless. Um, even though he just met Noadon, which I think is kind of an odd, um, reaction to that, that he thinks he's kind of disappointed in the vision right after he met Noadon. Um, but Navani's like, whoa, 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 uh, shut up. What was the last thing you said? And Dalinar's like, wait, what do you mean? The last thing you said in the vision. What was the last thing you said in the vision? Um, and then she writes it down. Um, and then she translates it from what he said in the Dawn chant and says, you've been speaking the Dawn chant. And Adolin is sitting there like, wait, what? Like he's just speaking gibberish, and Navani is like, no, there's a, there's a, a deliberate pattern to what he's saying, um, and she translates an entire sentence of the dawn chant, and could potentially translate the rest of the language from it, um, which is kind of important. Well, and the important part I took away from that, too, is this language is a dead language, right? It's not a language mm-hmm. they even know. M- more than a dead language, I suppose. Not only does no one speak it, they don't know, they don't have any translations of it. It's right. Like hieroglyphics or something. So she's super excited that this could be the, the Rosetta Stone, if you will, that unlocks this language they've never understood before. I thought that was super cool. I'm not going to lie. I didn't even realize that it was that dead of a language. I thought it was like how we think of, you know, like Latin Greek or something, right? Like, right. like it's not used, but we, we can understand, like we can translate it. We have the, the tools to do so. Um, I didn't actually realize that that's kind of crazy. I do remember that moment. And I think that was really cool with, uh, with, with Dalinar and speaking this language, this like dead language, you know, I had something else to say. <laughs> if it, Hold if it on. gives you any more context, they have a lot of ancient scripts written in the Dawn chant that they can't interpret yet. But now that they, or if this is truly what Navani um, thinks it is, she, may have the key to unlock a lot of ancient texts that nobody knows anymore. I bet Yasna is going to be excited when she hears about that. Seems like something she'd be into. Yep. Yasna and Navani are mother daughters, so there is that. 
Hey, you need you need dad learned the <laughs> language. <laughs> it taught us how to read this ancient language. So, spoiler alert: Navani and Dalinar kiss in the next chapter. Yes, they do. So there's um, that. I'm not a fan. <laughs> <laughs> before before they do in mm-hmm. chapter sixty, opening chapter sixty one, Navani, um asks Dalinar about the Night Watcher. Um, Dalinar has mentioned before that he's been to the Night Watcher, he's visited, and Navani is wondering if these visions could be related. And they've brought that up before, um, that if these are related. And Dalinar is convinced, convinced, that they are not related at all. Which I'm not sure how you could be so convinced, because you're talking about magic that you don't understand. And if you're totally convinced that these visions that you don't understand aren't tied to another magic that you don't understand that, but Navani hasn't dismissed it from the table that this could be from the night watcher. Um, any thoughts on old magic night watcher, all these weird terms. I totally agree that dealing with mystical unknown magical powers, you definitely can't rule anything out so for Dalinar to dismiss it seems a little bit silly of him but I think I learned from that though that he very clearly knows or thinks he knows what he was given by the Night Watcher when he went to receive the old magic he was given a boon and he was given a curse he claims that he knows exactly what those were and they are not related to the visions that he's having now so I don't know if that's a or or clue, but it tells me that some very specific things that Dalinar can quantify, but noticeably doesn't in this chapter. I was looking for it to see if he'd tell us what his curse or his reward were, but he doesn't say it. He dances around it, and I'm real curious to see what those are. Any thoughts, Paul? I didn't, in all honesty, I didn't think about it too much. I, I am really curious about the the blessing and the curse there. Um, but as far as the Night Watcher and old magic in this chapter, I honestly kind of had bigger things in my mind throughout <laughs> throughout these chapters. Uh, I, I felt like chapter 60 was like a ton of information and honestly don't have anything notable on on this specific one. I feel like the all the old magic in Night Watcher is a little too ambiguous at the moment to really think about too much. There's way too many open space. Yeah, that's certainly that's certainly very common with Brandon Sanderson's writing. He'll have this huge scene and what you're supposed to be focused on um with this scene and he'll drop a few specifics here and there that um that you're supposed to pick that you're not really supposed to think about too much but in a but from a rereader's perspective um as you've known or as you get to know more about this you realize that things like this were mentioned way back way back in the way of kings like pretty early and you don't really get to know about it much more till later and you're not really supposed to think about it that too much so it's not that it's not like a bad thing or anything that you're not really overthinking this because you don't have that much information so why why would you after after they're done talking about the night watcher uh dalinar and navani have a moment we need we 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 have to address the uh the elephant in the room paul i know you don't like to talk about it but just a friendly reminder that they are not related they are not related by blood by by blood Correct. correct correct okay all right here's my okay I will literally only give it my two cents because I don't even want to talk about it much. So it's nothing against Dalinar or Navani. I'm not a huge fan, even especially in books, but even in like movies of the whole romance part. Just never a big fan, you know. And I specifically remember being like I was grocery shopping and listening to my audiobook. I just got <laughs> to hear this. You know, Brendan Sanderson's a great writer. So he did some great, you know, visualization of the whole scenario going on. And, you know, it was 
more than I needed while I was trying to pick up my cereal. <laughs> you know, like it was a little, it was a little too much. Well, Don't want to blush I say while you're t- grabbing your Cheerios. <laughs> yeah, okay. yeah, well, not just a little too much. I'm just never a fan. And like, in all honesty, like, I don't know. I I could have done without. I could have just had a little sentence like he embraced her and then just leave it at that. And then I'm like, okay, I get the picture. You know, but so you got I... you to gotta know how awkward it was for Donna. That's very important. It's very awkward. True. True. I'm going to label this one as unnecessary, though. Fair <laughs> enough. We got the big word. No, it, uh, in all honesty, there's nothing wrong with this. I'm just never going to be a fan, and I don't, I don't like it, you know? And it's nothing against Delano and Navani. It's just, it doesn't matter. Insert any characters here. It's just not going to appeal to me. And, and, I'd rather read about something more interesting. So, I mean, did did y'all read this? And you were like, oh, okay, this is a great tender moment, <laughs> you know? Like, did, did you think, I mean, it's fine if you do, but it's just not not what I thought. Elliot? That's that's totally <laughs> fair, Paul. I, I definitely picked up on the the awkwardness of this, which Trevor, I think you're saying is, is kind of the point. You're supposed to feel some of the awkwardness of the, the Dalinar is placed in, and I, I felt some of that too. But I will say... Part of it that made me feel a little bit better was learning a little bit of Navani's background through this. She does mention and kind of spells out that ever since Gavilar's death, she's become a little bit of an outcast. She's been kind of pushed to the fringes of the of the royal court, and she kind of gets ignored by everyone else. So we at least get the get the understanding that she's very lonely. She's she's looking for some companionship. She's looking for a friend. She's looking for you know, a, a love interest. She's looking for you know, someone to love her because she's very much on the outside right now. And that that makes me feel a little bit better, better about the situation, honestly, just because it's not like she's, I don't know, being or just kind of picked you down or like, I want that one and, you know, going after him <laughs> in, in that kind of manner. It, it's it's really just, she, she's lonely. She's on the outside. She's loved, you know, in the past, he's loved her. So it's it's the rekindling of a of a flame, if you will. And, I will say I was a little bit hard on Dalinar a few episodes ago when we talked about this, and I, I took a rather hard line on how he was treating or, or allowing himself to accept this relationship or not. And I, I think I'll I'll maybe revise that just a little bit, just to say that I I don't have anything I don't have anything against this relationship. I think that everything that's going on, as you say here, Paul, is fine. This this is fine. Uncomfortable and awkward, but. But fine. I, I do hope that Dalinar, though, does does stay true to his his code. That I do think he needs an element of accountability. If he if he's going to start doing things that he's calling out the other officers and the other light eyes for doing, that's kind of going back on his on his code of honor, and that is a a besmirch on his character, if you will. Not necessarily a romantic aspect of it, if you if you will. That was my take on it all. And this is also a scene that we know if, if there's ever any kind of movie or show adaptation, we'll be in that. And this would be the perfect, it's the perfect little break. You know, you go to the bathroom and get some more water <laughs> and then come back and you get to enjoy the go get your, enjoy go get your snack. Yeah. Yes, exactly. <laughs> so, Elliot, you, you highlighted something that is actually fairly important here. There's There's been a a few hints in those these last couple chapters of Dalinar's code of honor here. And the last time Navani and Dalinar were together, Dalinar addressed it in that light of I can't I can't allow this to happen because I've told myself I won't. And if I start doing things that I've told myself I won't, then how am I any better? And I would argue I'm far worse than these other exactly. high princes. And I want to bring you back to working with Sadius. Dalinar has kind of met Sadius halfway here. Sadius has he's Sadius has expressed an interest in the way of kings, but only after Dalinar has been willing to work with him on the bridge runs. And Dalinar has been using Sadius's bridge crews to work with Sadius. So there have been a few steps that Dalinar has taken 
that could you could question his he's sacrificing some of his moral codes and it's hard to it's hard to decide which what's acceptable and what's not here right so is the relationship with navani a problem no not really the Voran church forbids it but they don't appear to care because you know the alethi don't really care about their religion um but is the fact that he is sacrificing something that originally he was very hard set on just that is that fact a problem even though the act itself may not be a big problem yeah i agree with everything you just said and i don't have i don't have the answer to to what you're what you're asking it is an ethical question i think that perhaps Dalinar is going to have to confront before the before the end of this maybe have to decide how how true to his code is he going to hold or is he being is he true to it, being true to his 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 code or or is he breaking it that's probably something he's going to have to wrestle with are there any closing thoughts on the Dalinar section here time for Kaladin Agreed. It is indeed time for Kaladin. All right. Oh, boy. So chapter 62. Chapter 62 is a favorite of a lot of Stormlight Archive readers, and for good reason, because, I mean, it's finally happening, right? De Kaladin is finally not only realizing what he can do, but using it, and... He's using it to protect the Bridgemen, not only Bridge 4, but it turns out all the Bridgemen. They don't lose a single Bridgemen in this bridge run because he's sitting there doing a bunch of gymnastics and dancing around all these arrows. Um, any any initial thoughts on this chapter? This word gets overused all the time in relation to books like this, but ever another scene that you can just picture so clearly in your mind this epic build up to the parshendi facing them down they know it's going to be a bloodbath but here comes kaladin stepping to the front leading the the charge i even love the moment where the the bright lord guy that's that's um i can't remember his name now that's Who's... in charge of the the bridge crews yep who has the wife who's really bossy he th there's even a description of him like yelling out screaming after Kaladin as he, he sees him breaking ranks and charging you know he can see his career and maybe his life you know falling all in this moment of Kaladin breaking ranks and and doing something again that's not what he's supposed to be doing it turns out incredibly well and you get this awesome scene of Kaladin just dodging arrows left and right and you know catching some on his shield and some of them are sticking in his vest and before he knows it the, all the bridge crews get there and every single bridge is put down which we know at this point is is huge that never happens and right. it was a big 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 moment it was really cool the one of my favorite little scenes in this whole chapter is when sadius rides up and he's kind of you know he, he recognizes kaladin is like oh it's this guy again and yeah he, um the the wife's name is Brightness of Shaw, but I don't remember the the bright the bright lord's name. It starts name. with an M. I'm sure it starts with M. Uh, is it is it Matal? It might be. Um and Sadius is like, Well, lucky for you it works. I guess I have to promote promote you now. Like it's so offhand and flippant, he's just like, Well, I guess I, I don't have anything else to do besides promote you, and then he rides off to battle. <laughs> it's it's just a funny interaction to me that Sadius is so just flippant about who he promotes. And I I will say while you mention that, there's a part of that discussion actually that that caught my eye. The last couple of chapters started to to earn maybe some some cool points, if you will, back. Not a lot, but a few. He's inquiring about. The, the way of kings, he's actually having discussions with Dalinar. It seems like he's not trying to sabotage him anymore. Maybe he never was, but he's working with, with Dalinar. He seems to be showing a bit of his honor. But there's a, 
a phrase in the midst of his little discussion there that almost dashes all of that for me. And I'll, I'll read it for you. So here's, here's a section where Sadius is giving that backhanded promotion. Those savages practically ignored the assault force, all 20 bridges set, most with nary a casualty. It seems like a waste somehow. Consider yourself... That, that section there where he says, it seems like a waste somehow, comes right after all 20 bridges set, most with nary a casualty. He thinks the fact that there were hardly any bridgemen casualties as a waste. What a backwards way of thinking about that. He feels disappointed because not enough bridgemen died in the run. Yeah. You know, like, why did we bring all these bridges if they were all going to make it, you know? Yeah. Yep. Brutal. Yeah. I anyway. definitely missed that. Not going to lie. That That is kind of rough. And we were just I... talking about Sadius, I feel like, last episode, so... <laughs> And now he's kind of he's kind of been redeemed a little bit, you know. He he's getting better, but that it definitely doesn't help his case. It is certain. I I'm very glad you found you found that Elliot because I certainly didn't miss it. It's it's telling. It's rough. It yeah. Is. I'm not saying there's no hope for Sadius, and I think even Dalinar feels there's no hope for Sadius. There was a section in one of the Dalinar chapters earlier where he's even saying, hey, you know, give Sadius a chance kind of thing. And I'm not willing to throw the, the towel in quite yet and say Sadius is a lost cause. If the, Dalinar still might be able to turn him around or, or help him in some way, but the man's a bit twisted inside, and this mm -hmm. tells you that he is. So I have to say, so this has been my favorite, like, action scene by far in the in the book as far as i can remember okay i felt like this chapter was awesome like the writing with kaladin's dodging all the arrows and stuff and i feel like in the previous episode where we i believe at the end of those chapters like chapter 59 was it where kaladin kind of starts toying with his surge binding abilities and starts like climbing right mm -hmm. and i was actually kind of upset with that chapter i was like come on like don't be so slow like this is gonna be <laughs> he's gotta he's gotta be the best he, like he's gonna be awesome but i was actually kind of uh, the chapter was almost agonizing for me because i was like come on he's just climbing like do something cool you know right <laughs> um but but this is really where he really catches that wind and and, and just kind of goes off here and I thought it was awesome. The The writing was incredible. Like the description, I could imagine it so vividly. And like, this is, this is definitely that like kind of pinnacle breakthrough. Awesome moment. Like at least visually, like I think of in a movie sense, if that was to ever happen, this would be a major, major scene. Oh yeah. yeah. Um, and I really loved it, it. It also mentioned just a cool little detail uh, with the surge binding, I guess. I guess with like kind of the stormlight emitting from him, it talked about how some of the arrows would kind of like warp around him, or like mm -hmm. I don't remember if they were being pulled in or pushed out. But either way, I was like, okay, that's that's super cool. Um, and it, it was crazy. And not to mention that he's doing this, and it is just making the Parshendi furious because he's he's desecrating <laughs> yeah yeah they, they're dead which they care for so dearly that's like the the way to really get under their skin <laughs> uh, and was that a twisted joke and, because they it he has, wasn't intended yeah. to be, but it was <laughs> oh no <laughs> uh, cringe I was about to say no pun intended but oh man okay so so kaladin's really under the parshendi skin right now and uh, um and and they're just literally, literally all of the archers are firing at, at just him and he's just shrugging it shrugging it off. It even says he gets hit sometimes and and it just he this the stormlight just kinda seals that up and it's it's so epic, like an awesome moment. So I absolutely loved it. It was kind of one of those pinnacle breakthrough chapters where we really get to see what Kaladin can do. And now I'm just super excited from here on forward, like what this is gonna what that's gonna be like i want to i want to highlight the the arrows you mentioned for a second the 
Kaladin discovers that he's perhaps causing the arrows to change direction and to he thinks about the bridges and the couple of instances we saw where the arrows hit the bridge like all around his head but none of them hit him and i think i think that's an example of kaladin doing another lashing i i again same as last time last time we kaladin had done a full lashing of binding the rocks to the wall i flip back to the zeth prologue again where we get those those descriptions of the different types of lashings that he uses this one fits along with the description of the reverse lashing that we get. In the Zeth chapter, we get told this. A required his constant touch, but took comparatively little stormlight. During one, anything that approached him, particularly lighter objects, was instead pulled toward the lashing itself. So this makes perfect sense. If Kaladin's carrying the bridge, he's, he's in contact with the bridge the whole time, accidentally imbuing it with this latching, lashing, which then causes objects, lighter objects, just like an arrow, to attract to that instead of to his face. So I think Kaladin now knows how to do a full lashing and a reverse lashing. He just doesn't necessarily know that's what they are. Correct. Good spot. Well done. It is. Well done. So so I do want to. I do want to say... Oh, did you have a thought, Trevor? I was going to kind of move us. Yeah, go for it. I I think we're about to do the same thing. So all of this scene was really epic, really exciting. One of the coolest action scenes we've had so far. But I, I got to say, I left this chapter with a little bit of a bad taste in my mouth. And honestly, that's coming from the fact that really it all comes down to the reaction that we see from Shen their parchment that's in their group and how broken he after witnessing what Calden has just done. He he's in tears. He can't even like stand up. He's so shattered by what he's just witnessed Calden do. And that's why I picked the word desecration for this, because I think Calden doesn't understand and we don't either the the magnitude of what he's just done. And I think I think he's going to come back to, I think he's going to regret this in the future. And the reason why I say that is my running theory about the Parshendi is that they're being manipulated or controlled or used by someone else. I don't think necessarily that the Parshendi are the enemy per se. I think someone else has orchestrated to get the Parshendi to fight the Alethi. And so I, it seems very reasonable to me that it's someday in the future the Parshendi are no longer going to be the enemy. They might figure this out and realize, oh, we don't have to fight each other anymore. We could be friends. We could be allies. We could work this out. If that happens, though, I don't think Kaladin is ever going to be an ally of the Parshendi after this. Even if we get to that point where the Parshendi are no longer an enemy, Kaladin is still going to be an enemy of the Parshendi maybe forever, right? based on what he's just done. And so that worries me. That worries me for for Kaladin going forward. If it helps you with any with hints of the magnitude of what just happened, towards the end of chapter sixty two, the Parshendi rush bridge four with a shard yes. bearer right behind them. There's a shard bearer Dalinar on their tail, and they don't care. They are trying to kill bridge four at all costs. And Dalinar comes and saves them. That's how much they hate Kaladin right at this moment. I'm glad you mentioned that, Trevor. That's actually one thing I really wanted to bring up. In in that Kaladin almost dies right after. Like he basically sees his life flash before his eyes because he's made all these Parshendi so mad, but he thinks it's all good now because all the bridges have landed and the army has arrived. But they don't care. They're they're still going to come after him specifically. Yep. And so a bunch of was it the archers? A bunch of archers break through yep. or yep. some soldiers, and and they're ready to shoot at him. But fortunately, Dalinar actually jumps in and kind of wipes through the whole lot of them in the blink of an eye, which was also a pretty cool moment. Which yeah, I could classic sharp arrow. Well. Yeah, exactly. Um, I also thought that was really cool, just because. I thought it was kind of funny because because we've heard a few mentions before where 
the bridge men or these people mention like, oh, Dalinar, Dalinar Colin, the, the Blackthorn or whatever. And Kaladin's like, who is that guy? Like, what's so special about him? And then he kind of swoops in there and saves the day and just kind of goes back to fighting. Mm-hmm. And I don't know, I thought that was kind of cool. I feel like Kaladin is going to remember that. And um, and no, I mean, they they totally shrug it off and they're like, ah, he, he just saw... Um, an unexpected group of Parshendi, right? Which is likely pretty true. I mean, if he saw that opportunity and just swooped in there, but um, but but it was kind of cool to see from a distance. Kaladin got to see Dalinar and stuff, and so he kind of knows who he is. Barely, he saw him. Just just a little tidbit, like a little flash of those those uh, storylines coming together. Yeah, which is what I really want to happen. So, <laughs> I thought that was cool. And there's an element there, though, that makes it even more significant because, and Kaladin notes this that after Dalinar clears that section of archers, he salutes specifically to Kaladin, or at least to the bridgeman, with his shard blade before he moves on. And Kaladin even thinks to himself, like, "Oh, he was probably just taking out the closest group, but he saluted us." interesting the the thought i had on reading that was kaladin's reputation is going to explode after this if he if he was flying under the radar which he almost wasn't he already had a reputation for surviving the high storm Mm -hmm. now he just did this incredible feat in front of the entire army and people at dalinar's level and sadius's level not only saw it but are acknowledging it everybody everybody is going to know about what Kaladin has done now. He's on a whole new level now. The One of the first reactions is when all the all the bridge four run up after they've set their bridge, Sigsil says, you should be dead. Sigsil is very preoccupied. He's running a bridge against Parshendi, but he's still watching Kaladin, and the entire army who's standing right behind them is watching Kaladin, and Sigsil's initial reaction is, you should be dead. Everybody else's reaction is, you should be dead. So everybody yep. is going to be like acknowledging who Kaladin is at this point. Note that also, though, he should be dead. He absolutely should be. No man should be able to survive, you know, hundreds of archers all focusing their intent on one person. And yet, look how many bridgemen volunteer to do the exact same thing. Yeah. They all know that doing something like that is almost a guaranteed death. And yet they're so inspired by Kaladin, they immediately volunteer. It's like the first thing out of their mouth. I forget who the first one, Moash or somebody Moash. else, jumps in and is like, oh, next time I'll, I'll do it with you. Let's let's do this. Like, yep. wow, that's cool. Yeah, it really was cool. Mo- yeah, Moash runs up to him and is like, we need to expand this. That was amazing. I like. I'll do it with you. Who else is with me? And they, everybody just really wants to help. So yeah, you're you're totally right that this is not this is not Bridge Four that we met at the beginning of the book. This is Bridge Four completely ready to put their lives on the line for each other. In Chapter Sixty Three, Kaladin has a passing comment of, "If we run now." we will be too important for Sadius to let go. Sadius will not be willing to let us go if we escape because of what we've because of what I've just done. I'm too prominent now that I'm I'm too important and Sadius won't just let us go. Any any thoughts on that thought? Yeah, I think he's I think he's right. He's He's saved his bridgemen and the lives of many other bridgemen through the various things that he's done. But by creating such a huge reputation for himself, there, there's no chance that they're just going to kind of sneak away and perhaps get swept under the rug as, oh, one of the bridge crews escaped. We'll, we'll hush it up and, and not worry about it. Yeah, that's not really a possibility anymore. Right, because that would be, it would be the bridge crew escaped. The, the right. one that's saving everybody else, they, they escaped. Yep. Yeah, I'm sure they definitely know who he is and 
what he looks like now and everything because he's uh, definitely been the star of the show over there with ever since the high storm really he he really has built quite the reputation so yeah you're right so also y'all y'all were men- mentioning moash i have to say like like you mentioned so moash is one of the bridgemen i haven't cared for partly because i mean he he hasn't done anything that exciting really and also he's kind of just generic uh pessimistic bridgemen you know nothing too exciting but we do start to see a little bit of development with him i feel like and we get to see um a little bit about his like motivation and i don't know if if you want to talk about that but i thought that was super interesting it really really made me interested in him i I haven't really been before but now i really want to know what he wants or maybe why he's he talks about revenge right he does talk about revenge yep so up until this point moash has been the able-bodied indignant bridgeman he's He's there, but he's there for himself. And if Kaladin's going to get them free, he'll work with Kaladin, and he'll he'll be willing to follow Kaladin. And he's grown a respect for Kaladin, but he he was one of the last ones to to join up. And he's certainly physically able. He's one of the most fit bridgemen. He takes down Kaladin when Kaladin is trying to run to the bridge to save Dunny, and Moash um, realizes that it's too late, and Kaladin's just going to get himself hurt or killed um but so he's he's one of the more physically able bridgemen but his motive we we haven't you're right we haven't heard motivation from him yet and he's been one of the more mouthy uh bridgemen but you're right in 63 he does mention revenge i um i want to i want to kill someone is what he says and kaladin says well who who do you want to kill and Moash kind of hesitates for a second and doesn't tell him. He uh, doesn't want to doesn't want to give that away. Moash is good about keeping a straight face and no spoilers as well. True. Do we have any guesses? I'm kind of clueless because we don't know much about him, right? But I feel like that's got since they made a deliberate point of mentioning that. I feel like it's got to be someone either really notable or someone else that we do know. Watch it be Ishik. I, I was <laughs> gonna say I was gonna throw a long shot out there and say that it's Hoyd. Why would it be Hoyd? I don't know. What we don't know them. He's super. He's kind of an enigma right now. So okay, that's just my my long shot. My guess would be Sadius or someone we haven't met. I, I honestly would guess that Moash's story has, has to do with characters that we don't know. But if it had to be someone that we do know, I'd probably go to the top and say it was is, was Sadius and have something to do with him becoming a, a bridgeman. That's fair. But yeah, fair. I don't know. Teft and Kaladin have an interesting conversation teft accuses kaladin of being afraid of the spear and at this point we haven't seen kaladin pick up a spear since he did the kata back in chasm duty which was back in part two i believe um kaladin he initially he he dismisses it of no i'm not scared of it and Teft kind of presses him on it. He says, no, the last time you picked it up, you failed, didn't you? And Kaladin says, yeah, you're right, I did. Um, and Kaladin is convinced that, yeah, w- when the time comes, I'll pick up a spear and, and fight, don't worry. And Teft ends the chapter with, well, you better, because these guys will need you. So Kaladin, if we've learned anything about Kaladin so far, it's that he's a very emotional boy. And if if picking up a spear is that emotional for him, if he can't disconnect his his brain from the the spear when he holds it, that might be important that he's not 
not mentally prepared to to fight yet. I kind of took it as he he acknowledged that he's scared, but not necessarily scared in the sense that like he's afraid to go into battle again. I thought it, I kind of came away with the thought of he's scared of what he might become or what he knows he will become when he lets himself step back into that role of the soldier. And that's even compounded more now that he has these new abilities. I bet he's thinking in, even now in his mind, what devastation could I cause now that he has these surge binder powers in conjunction with his already natural spear wielding ability that he has. I think he's a bit scared of just what a powerful force he would, he knows he would become and doesn't want to step into that unless he needs to. Right. That, that was my feel on it. If it gives you any context, he is the son of Liren and Liren is has the has very different views on the price of a life than Sadius does, for example. So if he's if during his time as a soldier he was able to kill a lot of a lot of people, if that scared him and he knows he's capable of that, um he may be hesitant to pick up the spear again. I think so. Elliot, you have in the outline who is Terra. Any comments? Not any comments other than that's a question at this point. So twice now in these chapters, 60, once in 62 and then again in 63, Kaladin mentions a new character that I don't remember hearing about before, and the name is Terra. And we've had a few, there's a couple different times where Kaladin like reminisces about people he failed to save. And sometimes he'll throw in like random names that we don't really know who they are, but clearly it's in reference to he, this was a person around him who died. He feels like he's cursed, etc. Another character being referenced in that context, but we get a few more, he, he dwells on it longer than he usually does with some of the other random names. So I'm, I'm kind of thinking this person might be important in his past. Uh, I believe it's refer, I believe it refers to as, as a she, Tara. Mm -hmm. uh, a girl yep so and, and maybe the influence that she had on him of i don't remember exactly but they they clearly had some kind of a either a friendship or maybe even like a romantic relationship like a love interest i'm i'm kind of curious here just because it was mentioned with a little more detail than some of the other names so another person from kaladin's past maybe we'll learn about in the future i hope we learn about I'm not giving you anything, sorry. Of course not. Sometimes I'll, yeah. I'll throw in a comment, but not this time. Okay. Bummer. I feel so like... I do have... Go ahead, Paul. I was going to say, with, with character... Like, the mention of Terra here... I guess maybe, maybe I'm criminally not looking into it enough. So... With these chapters, I feel like there were so many awesome moments that it's really easy to o overlook some of these little things. Like Terra, and I mentioned previously with the Night Watcher and the Old Magic, those are probably huge. Those are probably enormous things like in this world. Um, I'm getting the impression that Brandon Sanderson is doing that on purpose. He's he's writing mm -hmm. this like gleefully, ooh, this is going to be a big, fun, epic scene. People are going to enjoy this. I'm gonna slide this little hint right here so that all of you miss it as you're enjoying this this epic, you know, fun adrenaline scene. And then you'll come back later and realize, oh, there was a hint to it right here, tucked away in the in the exciting chapter. I, I think he's doing it on purpose. That's exactly I, I think, what's happening. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think you're right. And honestly, I'm glad you, you're mentioning it because I I totally would have just been the sucker first time reader, you know, where I'm <laughs> I don't think twice about it. I'm like, oh, oh whoa, Kaladin dodge arrows, whoa. Yep. <laughs> and uh, don't think, don't think twice about it. But uh, I'll, 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 I'll note this down. I'll try to remember these names. You have to look for more of of Terra in the future. Mm -hmm. If it makes you feel any better, Paul, that was exactly me on my first read through. I <laughs> didn't even remember Terra was even mentioned in the Way of Kings until yeah. a couple rereads, and I was like, oh wait, I would have had. I would have had no idea. <laughs> yep. The others, like the old magic and stuff like that, I would have known. Like I would have known, remembered that vaguely, but not not specifically with Terra here. 
a lot of these two, it's just, it's the name drop. It's getting you familiar with the term so that it, when it comes up later, like, like Shadesmar. We've, we've heard the term, we know it's an aspect of the world, but we don't know the definition of it yet, right? So, or, or odium. Or odium. Or, that. yeah, there's a couple other ones. Or the Dawn Singers or the Radiance, you yeah. know. As we get to know more about these things, we, we're familiar with the term, but we just don't know what, how to define it yet. So, so I have a crazy idea for you guys to, to close out this episode if you're ready for it. Let's hear it. So not even all that related to what's going on in these chapters. I just had a thought as I was finishing these chapters. I came up with an idea for how Kaladin could escape. Okay. And I don't know that maybe he wants to escape or should escape because society's going to come after him, but I had an idea. He's talked about if they could escape through the east side of the Shattered Plains, they think they could get away. They could they could be beyond Sadius's reach. They'd be they'd be free to go. They just know they can't survive there because they're going to get hit by a high and they won't be able to make it. I had a thought. I think it was mentioned at some point that the Shattered Plains drain to the east. I might have that wrong, but I mm -hmm. think that was the the statement that the high storms come, the chasms flood, it drains to the east. What if? As soon as a high storm finishes, like during that, I forget what they call it, the riddens or whatever at the end of the storm. Right. If all the bridgemen were to run out, grab their bridge, run down to the chasm, throw their bridge in the chasm and jump on it, use it as a boat to ride the flood through the chasms all the way to the east side and get out and be gone, Sadius could never chase them. <laughs> I dig it. I think it's foolproof. That is, it would work. That is awesome. They should try. I I agree. I have a I have a very large hunch that they won't try something like that. But I've solved your problem, Calvin. You're welcome. Yeah, exactly. Wow. Just hit them up via span read. Let them yep. know. Oh yeah. Yeah. But now that now the question is, how many bridgemen can you fit on one bridge if they're they're sitting shoulder to shoulder? <laughs> Yeah, and true. I mean, they can all bridge. get underneath it to to carry it. Yeah, there's a lot of questions of would it even fit in some of the chasms? Would they get stuck somewhere? I, there, there's risks for sure, mm. but that's that's awesome. That's so funny. The, I I just, I just have a mental image of them just getting wedged like like in a chasm, and then the water <laughs> draining underneath them, and then they're just sitting like just stuck. Yeah, they're just stuck like halfway up a chasm until the next high storm, and then they like kind of jostle free and keep going. That's that's really funny. All right, any any closing thoughts for uh for chapters sixty through sixty three? I think this may have been my favorite episode to talk about so far. Just every chapter was just super exciting. Even though there was the romance scene, I wasn't a fan of. It was still great all the way through. I couldn't get enough of these chapters. All right, Paul. This, this if... set definitely had a little bit of everything. It had the thinkiness of Noadon. It had the awkward romance. It had the incredible action. It had some good Kaladin drama emotions. It had it all. It and did. some little hints as to what is to come, maybe. With, with we mentioned there with Terra and uh, yep, the other things, Night Watchers and such. Yeah. Uh, Paul, if you enjoyed the action of this episode, I promise you, you will enjoy next episode. Uh, oh man! Next Let's episode, go. it we will be doing chapters sixty-four all the way through sixty-nine, and we'll probably be splitting it into two parts and just talking about the entire thing all at once. So we're going to be ending part four next week, and I am very excited to talk about it with you guys. Very excited. Can't Let's wait. do it. I can't wait to read these. Gonna be awesome. Thanks for joining me, guys, and I'll see you next week. Farewell. Later. <laughs>